All right, so we have 12 small things that we're going to talk about today. And I would like to just mention that we are interested in um, your feedback on like, it's like these are all things that could potentially just be addressed in an email or in a newsletter. So at the end of the survey or at the end of the session, we're going to give you a survey. And I want your honest feedback on like, was this even helpful to talk about it? Or would it have been better if we just sent it to you in an email? So try to keep that in your mind as we're going through this. Um, the first thing that I want to talk to you guys about is that we're chunking this into three sections. So we've got our data privacy agreements. I'm going to give you a heads up on, on some of those. Um, we've got legislative updates that we want to give you a heads up on and some other stuff as well. So starting with data privacy agreements, this is just kind of a refresher. Some of you might know this, um, but we try to kind of speak to the audience knowing that some people are new data managers and some people are veterans. So if you, um, if I'm telling you something you already know, don't uh, try not to feel insulted. We're just wanting to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So data privacy agreements, we usually call them DPAs for short. These are like sort of side contracts that um, LEAs enter into in addition to like a traditional contract um, with a vendor. And you almost always, in almost all cases, if you're gonna be sharing student data with a third party, you'll almost always need to have a data privacy agreement in place. The only exception to that would be if the current contract of the vendor already contains um, the provisions required. So, or the other cases when it's, it's a state contract. So we at the state have already kind of included those privacy provisions in our contract. So DPA is a word you'll hear a lot um, throughout this training, data privacy agreement. And for those of you who are not familiar, we also have a really powerful tool available to all of you for free, which is called the Student Data Privacy Consortium. So it's a consortium, meaning it's like a group of um, people kind of, you know, going together for a common cause. But it's also, it also acts as like a tool to allow you to enter into data privacy agreements in a more um, standardized and efficient way. So, Oh, let's say I just saw a question from Angela. Is there a place where LEAs can get the actual contracts that are held by the state? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's something that I've been working on in my time in this position. I There's some level of confidentiality that's required of state contracts initially, like before they're signed. I don't, I, I'm wanting to work with some folks here at USBE to see if that confidentiality requirement remains past the time that it's signed, because I do think it would be really good for you guys as LEAs to be able to actually see the contracts that we have in place. Um, I'm speaking for USBE right there for as far as like UETN, the contracts that they enter into, historically, they've liked to keep those um, like internal. So I don't know about those, but we where USBE enters into contracts, I'm hopeful that we can get those into your hands. Um, but I just need to <laughs> yeah, Robert says file a grandma request. Um, I'm, I imagine that that should be a non-issue. All right, so um, again, SCPC is a tool where you can go to originate, meaning sign up for a data privacy agreement for the first time, or you can do what we call like piggybacking off of an existing agreement. So if another district or charter school in the state has entered into a, a data privacy agreement with a vendor, um, SDPC has a feature that allows you to go in and, and sort of say, hey, me too. Like, I also want to enter into this same agreement with the vendor. And that's pretty slick. Okay, so um, in this section, we're going to be going through, I think, four products that we want to make you aware of from the DPA, the Data Privacy Agreement perspective. Okay, the first one is Kids Read Now. So this contract passed... I think in maybe two months ago, maybe a month ago. And um, this, is a, this is a program that was um, kind of required by legislation. And the, the program sends books home to kids and specifically they're aiming, I believe to do this over the summer to try to um, prevent the, the slide that sometimes happen in the summer with st students kind of like losing some of their literacy skills. 
this only applies to schools that are Title I schools or schools that are participating in the um, Partnerships for Student Success Grant program. So that's not all of you, but it is many of you. And if that's the case, if you are one of those schools, then we wanted to give you a heads up on a few things. Also, I'll just mention that all of these action items that you're going to see on the following slides, all of them are contained in our closing doc that we'll give you at the end. So you don't need to write things down necessarily. We'll also give you access to this slideshow so you can come back and revisit it if you want to. Um, Katie, so if you, oh, yes. Um, there is just a question, I believe, about uh, Kids Read Now from Angela. Have they actually executed the contract? KRN is already requesting student data uploads and I have a call in with them about the DPA and or contract. Oh yes, okay, so there's kind of two parts to this contract. One was the USBE part because we are the ones that are paying for it. Um, but they also, Kids Read Now or KRN, they also need to obtain a DPA with you and they have originated that. I can't remember, was that with Troy that Troy did that? John, you might remember Troy Lent and yeah, Iron District. County did that. We did that. About okay, two yeah. Weeks. So someone already originated it. So if you go into SDPC, um, and we assisted with that process, so we feel good about the, the language and stuff that's in there. So you can just go piggyback off of that one when you're ready. And then it's really important. It was really important to the board to make sure that that you guys at the LEA level are notifying parents of what's involved if they participate. So the board was really interested in making sure that there, and I think we actually have a board member on the call with us. I think member Klein is here with us. So um, it was really important to the board that parents are notified, not only of the fact that they're gonna be receiving books, but also that if they participate, certain data will be shared with the vendor. And so, uh, so the what the guidance for LEAs for me for you guys is to notify parents of what's involved in this and then also give them instructions on how to opt out if they if they don't want their data shared or if they want to opt out for any other reason like they don't want the books sent or whatever. Okay, so Pika Pack, this is this is I want to be clear that this is not happening for sure. <laughs> I wanted to just give you a heads up. There is legislation from last year that requires USBE to obtain uh, some kind of um, social emotional learning curriculum. It's specifically for, um, let's see, what's the word they use? Sort of like healthy habits or something like that. And, and then the legislation was to enter into one of these. And then also there's like a research component included. So. That is the case for, uh, this is the product that some of the staff at USBE are, have entered into or are hoping to enter into, but they're taking it to the board next month. So it's possible that the board will, will decline this contract. So all this is to say, I'm giving you a heads up on this, but it's not necessarily going to happen with this vendor. Ultimately, we will need to have some kind of vendor that does this. Um, what will happen if it passes is it'll there will be 32 LEAs involved because it's kind of like a, a research uh, study, I guess you could say. So if you participate, so first of all, if this passes, and second, if you participate, um, then you'll need to get a DPA with Pika Pack. And in talking with the vendor, we've told them that we felt that it would be really important that this be not an opt out, but an opt in for parents. So they would have to actually like, sign and say, yes, I agree to using this before um, before any data could be shared with PikaPack and before the students participated. Additionally, there might be a second uh, DPA required with the researchers. So like I say, I want to reiterate, this is not passed yet. It's a maybe. We'll see what happens in board meeting next month. Um, Here's another. Katie, there's oh, yeah. another question. I'm not sure if they were asking about uh, Kids Read Now or PikaPack. Um, Mark Allen, um, he's saying we will not be Title I next year, and I became the interim executive director this morning and do not know if we are part of the grant. I asked our previous director a while back, but never got a response. Does anyone know if Mountain Sunrise Academy is on that grant? And, so by, I guess and Mark, question. is the grant you're referring to, is it the Kids Read Now one? Oh, maybe, and maybe he can't. I don't know if he can even come off mute. But I, that's a good question. And Mark, I would say if you could shoot me an email, katie.chalice at schools.utah.gov. 
and I'll, I'll put you in contact with the person who could answer that question for you. Okay, Kara, heads up. I am gonna need longer than 1025. So hopefully that's okay with you. Um, this is another, so Bellwether is another maybe. This is another contract that's going before the board um, next month. The youth in custody staff. So youth in custody means students that are either, that are in the custody of the state, either in like the juvenile justice system, or if they also call it custody, if they are um, in the care of the state. So like foster, um, foster kids. So they, youth in custody has this program that they use. And I think 25 LEAs, it's called check and connect. It's, it's interesting. So they have like mentors that kind of check in with the kids and that kind of thing. And the youth and custody team at USB is wanting to understand like how effective this program is. So they are seeking to contract with a vendor called Bellwether to help them conduct that research. If that goes through, it'll be presented to the board in May. And if the board approves it, then the participating LEAs will need to enter into a data privacy agreement with Bellwether. Um, the thing is there's only 25 LEAs that even have a check and connect program. So I, the, I suspect that the youth in custody team at USBE, that if this passes, that they will be in contact with the youth in custody coordinators at each LEA. But we wanted to give you a heads up on this since you'll likely be involved in obtaining that DPA. And this is also one of those same cases where once one person, once one LEA has um, entered into the agreement, then other people can can more easily piggyback off of that. All right, so this one is an interesting one, and this has like some elements of this is definitely going to happen, as well as some elements of we're not sure how this is going to play out. So there was some uh, currently, as you guys may know, there's there's an early interactive software program where each LEA, and I think even at the school level, different schools can decide within an LEA, can decide which software they want to use. And it's for, I believe, K-3 students. Um, some of the examples of the software that's currently available that USB has contracted with are, um, I think Imagine Learning is one of them. Oh, help me out in the chat if you guys can remember some of the other ones. I think Waterford is one. My understanding is that there's five. So Lexia, thank you. Yeah, Lexia Core 5, I think is one of them. Elevation. What is that? Elevation. Elevation. Oh, is Elevation one? is the one for, for ELLs. ELLs. Yeah. So, so currently the way this works is that every school or district can choose which product they want to use. There was a change in legislation in this last session that said, well, now we want to change that so that USB doesn't have the contracts anymore. Now every LEA gets to choose their own vendor, which could be any vendor that's even if they're not listed in that group of five. So you get to choose who you want to contract with, with for this, and then you get reimbursed through the Utah grants system or whatever. The reason I'm bringing this to you is because if the, well, and I should pause and say that first part is definitely going to happen. The second part is up for the board to consider, I think next month, um, which would be how do we, um, it's, they have to kind of consider like, how are these programs evaluated and how do, how does that play out in terms of data sharing? Yes, Stephen, this was the software for K3 reading. Um, so I think what's probably going to happen, assuming the board passes this, and so there might be changes, but no matter what, you're gonna to need to get a DPA with the company that you choose to contract with. Depending on what the board decides to do with the board rule, it's possible that you might need to make sure that the DPA includes language about providing data to a third party evaluator. So what this would look like is if you chose to contract with Imagine Learning, for example, Imagine Learning would need to, to agree to give some of the data to um, our program, a program evaluator so that they can assess like how effective the program is. It's all kind of nuanced, more information will come, but I just wanted to give you a heads up about it. All right, and now on to the legislative session. So um, the legislative session in Utah is very short. It's just January through February. It's about, I think, six weeks. So that took place, you know, a couple months ago. 
there's a book that USB puts together. Well, it's just a PDF. Um, and this link is also going to be in the closing doc for you to check out, but it's really helpful. And it includes all of the bills that pass that are relevant to education. Um, we are going to be talking about just four of those that felt relevant, in my opinion, were relevant for this audience. So here we go. Um, the first one is a law about gender identity policies. From talking with schools, my understanding is that this, this um, law will not change the practice of most schools, as far as I understand. So like I reached out to a couple of principals and I said, hey, what's your process? Like if a student wants to, you know, go by a different gender than their birth certificate, how, what's your process for that? And, and they said that they would, they would make changes based on the parent's request. So I believe that this law is probably in line with how most of you guys are already doing things, but just to be safe, make sure that you um, update any of your policies so that two things happen. First, um, a school cannot change a student's record regarding their gender identity without parental consent. Um, so you couldn't have a situation where a kid is like, um, you know, that is male on their birth certificate, but identifies as female. And if they were like, hey, can you change my information in the SIS? If their parent didn't give consent, then the school is not allowed to make that change according to this law. It also, the law also states that parents need to have access to any information that the school maintains regarding their child's gender identity. And um, this to me, this is just kind of a reiteration of what FERPA already guarantees. FERPA already guarantees that parents have access to any of their students' education records, but they, but they just kind of wrote this in there, I think probably just to, to guarantee that everything was on the up and up. Um, Robert asks, what happens if a student turns 18 and claims not to be a dependent? Yeah, that's a really interesting one because in terms of FERPA, the rights transfer to the student at age 18. This law, I don't believe, I don't believe it distinguishes for students that are 18. And so I, I don't have an answer for you, Robert. I think it's a, um, a good question that explores or that warrants exploration. Okay, so your action item on this one is to update your education, whoops, sorry, update any of your policies um, to reflect these new requirements that, again, I think most of work you were already doing in practice, but you just need to make sure that it's official. All right, next one, we've got education-related amendments. So this one was actually a modification to um, our law, which is the Student Data Protection Act. Oh no, that's a lie, this, that's a different one, I'm sorry. Okay, we've got something in the chat. We received an email earlier this year that indicated we can only identify gender from a birth certificate parents have to change the birth certificate certificate if they wish to change gender. Yes, I think that's true. I My understanding is that some student information systems might have two fields. One is the sex, which is what's on the birth certificate and has to be what's reflected on the birth certificate. That's the field that USBE collects via Utrex. Um, yeah, okay, so Logan, thanks for Thanks for reinforcing that. There, and then in some student information systems, there's also a second field that might be gender identity. I'm not sure, Logan, if you wanna tell us what it's called in PowerSchool, like the name of that field. But um, you're right that, is that, I don't know who I'm talking to, Kay James, if that might be Kathy, but oh yeah, viewable versus legal. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, good. So this, um, this law, I'll just give you a heads up quickly. I don't believe that any action will be required of you directly yet. What's going to happen with this one is um, it requires USBE to add a web page to our website that has a bunch of policies on it regarding school discipline. So it's a it's an effort to increase increase transparency for parents on how things are happen or how things are handled in school districts regarding school discipline, including cyberbullying and bullying. And then there's a second part to this bill, which is the one that I feel like most likely applies to you, which is that it allows parents, um, it's, it's asking that you SIMS develop a feature that allows parents to add notes to their child's record. Some people have called this the sticky note bill. Um, so the idea would be that a parent could add at, at least once a year and um, 
uh, at least that's the way the laws are in, is that it would need to be available at least once a year that a parent could go in and add or change notes to their child's record. So this could be something as simple as, um, you know, my student has, has a hard time making friends or my student, like it reminds me of what we used to get when I was a classroom teacher. On my disclosure form, I would have a space at the bottom that would say, hey, is there anything else you want me to know about your kid? So I, I see this feature as something similar to that. And I would get anything from like, my student is awesome. You're going to love having her in class to like one time I had a parent that was like, my kid is colorblind. So please make sure <laughs> I was a science teacher. So he's like, please make sure he doesn't like mix chemicals that will explode. <laughs> um, and then I think, I think there could be other notes as well. But this is a technical feature that's also going to need to be allowed, be created in your student information systems. So that's why I say um, the action will likely take place later, but I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. And the last legislative update is about cybersecurity reports. So there was a, a bill that was passed that created a new thing called the Utah Cyber Center. I believe it's like, a, like an organization housed within the Department of technology services or DTS at the state level. I think that's where it is, but it's it's new. It didn't exist until this bill created it. And um, I think the goal is to be just kind of like a place where there's someone who's like got cyber on the brain. And this also requires government agencies, which includes you guys, to report any breaches that occur that affect more than 500 uh, students or parents or, or any other individuals. You need to report that to um, to the Utah Cyber Center because they're brand new. I don't, I don't, they don't have any contact information yet, but once we have that information, we can send it out to you in our newsletter. Um, but so this is an interesting one. And I'll just reiterate or remind you that um, Utah law and board rule also requires LEAs to report significant data breaches to our team at USD to the student data privacy team. So just a reminder that if you're reporting to the Utah Cyber Center, make sure that you let us know as well. Um, and there's also a, a provision in here that has been interesting for education because it requires all government um, websites and email domains to change to be a .gov or a .edu. This is problematic for education because a .edu is reserved for only higher education. So there's been a lot of discussion about how this is going to play out um, in the K-12 space. And I don't know yet, but my guess is that there's like a feature, there's like a provision in the law that allows agencies to seek a waiver for this. So my guess is that probably LEAs will be, um, will have to contact the, the State Division of Technolo Technology Services and be like, listen, like we can't get a .gov and we can't get a .edu. Can you, can you waive this requirement for us? But I don't know for sure how that's gonna play out. I imagine more guidance will come to you going forward. Okay, so, and we'll just go through these last ones very quickly. Oh, there is one more legislative update. This one is, uh, this is the one that affects our, our bill, which is the Student Data Protection Act. And this one just kind of re reiterates that you need to not share student data um, unless it's aggregated or de-identified. And I would add that even de-identified data and even aggregated data should be shared with great caution. Uh, but the bill just kind of solidifies that. And then this is the part that's new. The bill says that LEAs can't share student data with a federal agency unless required by federal law. So I, in my review of this bill, I was kind of trying to think like, are, is there any situation where that would be problematic? I, I, first of all, I don't believe that LEAs are sharing much data with the federal agencies anyway, because it's USBE that's required to do most of the federal reporting. Um, but we want you guys to let us know if you foresee any unintended consequences of this law. Like if there is something, if there is some kind of data sharing that's going on that we don't know about that this law would prohibit, and that's going to cause a problem for you, just let us know. Okay, we're going to zoom through these last few. Gear Up Utah is an organization. Um, it's, a, it's a national organization, but it's Gear Up Utah is Utah specific. They receive, um, they receive, oh, let's see, Carrie, I just saw DCFS. Yes, so DCFS 
Um, yes, you can share information with them according to FERPA or if you get parents sign a release. And it's actually, DCFS is actually a state agency. It's, if we really called it the accurate thing, it would be the Utah Division of Child and Family Services. Yeah, thanks, Carrie. So Gear Up Utah is, a, is an organization that serves students who are um, generally considered at risk of not graduating, or um, maybe they might graduate, but they are unlikely to attend higher education. So um, this is, I think it's often largely based on income. And actually, no, I'm remembering now, they, tr they um, provide services to students that are I think considered low income at Title I schools. So it's it sounds pretty cool. They reached out to us and they said, hey, sometimes we want to like provide services to these kids and the LEAs are reticent to give us data. And I said, well, but in a way, that's a good thing because I'm glad to hear that you guys are being cautious. You are not required to give data to Gear Up Utah, but I do want you to understand that they are a legitimate program and part of participation in the program, it already requires parental consent. And the parents already agree to share um, student education records with the mentor that's working with the student. So just so you know, it's not like some random organization. Um, there are a few districts in our state that use Gear Up Utah really heavily, and they have really good success, and it really helps kids out. Um, so your information item here is just if they come to you, just know that they're legitimate, but you, again, you're not required to share information with them, um, but you may, and you can re reach out to us if you have any questions. Okay, last thing, last, second to last thing is that our um, USPA slash SDPC public folder has moved. This is the folder that John created that has a lot of really good resources about data privacy agreements, how to enter into one, and and um, model language for sending it out. And John also records his um, monthly calls and puts them in this folder. So in the closing doc, you'll find um, the link to the new one. So if you have this bookmarked, you can just bookmark the new one. And, oh crap, there's two more, okay. Changes to how long we post videos. USBE has been making some changes to our uh, policy on how long we retain videos. So historically, we've just posted something and just left it up there forever. Now, in general, we're going to be trying to post videos for no longer than like six months, um, just to make sure that everything is current and fresh. So um, some of our videos, if they are the kind of thing that we want to be available forever, will stay. So like our FERPA videos will all stay. But just a heads up that the webinars that we do, this spring training recording, for example, going forward, those are probably going to be available online for only about six months. And the very last thing is that if you are a records officer, um, we are asking you to update your points of contact. And the instructions on this are in the next slide. And just a reminder that these slides will be made available to you via the closing doc at the end of the session. Kara, I'm really sorry. You can still have your full time. Um, so go, go ahead and take your full 25 minutes and then I'll take the time that I ate up and I'll, I'll compensate in my session later. I'm really, I really apologize for that. So we're gonna turn it over to Kara. She's with the um, Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice. And I'm really excited for you to hear her, her presentation that um, kind of explains the implications and, and the practicalities of HB 117 from last year. So uh, Kara, go ahead and share when you're ready.